So hello and welcome to everybody. Hi Raymond, you just joined um, with Intimate Group for today's discussion, which I think is perfect. Um, and really appreciate you all being here. And again, today we're going to be talking about designing um, equitable employee experiences. So my name's Sasha from Workflow, and I'm going to hand over to Gemma shortly to do an introduction on her side as well. Um, but again, a couple of things here. Um, after we've shared our initial thoughts, we're going to kind of hand over to everybody on the call to see what your thoughts and opinions are. We really want this to be an active discussion. I know Gem was really keen for that as well. So we just we want this to be open sharing. Um, and uh, keep yourself on mute until we get to that point as well, if, if possible, um, and be respectful of each other's shared experiences as well. I'm sure some personal stories are going to come up, so we just want to be really mindful that everybody has different backgrounds and, um, and stories as well. And a caveat that we wanted to, to put in here as well is that we are still learning and we are not experts in this space necessarily. I'd love to meet someone that is a complete expert on full design, um, so we're still learning. And again, if we if we say anything or we don't say something that you want us to address, just call it out. Um, yeah, we'd love to walk away from this learning something new as well. So, Gemma, I don't know if you want to touch on that as well. Oh, yes, that's such a good point. I mean, there is so much to learn. And I think that there are nuances across regions as well. And one thing that when we were setting this up, um, that Sasha and I talked about was the language we use around particularly around disability and accessibility um, and Sasha had um, certain language which is the UK framing and I had an Australian framing of language which is around people with disabilities which is tend, tends to be the way we talk about things in Australia um, but even within um, the community of people with disabilities um, individuals want to be addressed and use different um, centricity of language. So people-centred language, identity-centred language, disability-first language, and there's a whole range. So I think that that just tells us that there isn't one size fits all, which is a perfect um, way of introduction, introducing this concept of equitable versus kind of equal and inclusive and in some of the topics we're going we're gonna to cover off. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and any references, so I'm going to run through a, a brief kind of overview and background on why this is such an important topic and why we're talking about this today. Um, so any references I will send in the follow up email to everybody as well. So I want to give credit where credit is due on research. Um, so actually, Gem, let me pass over to you. Do you want to tell us your business and your interest in this space? Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Um, so I'm Gemma Saunders. I'm based in Melbourne in Australia. I run a business called Workplace Edit. And really, my mission is to um, make workplaces truly work for more people and more organisations. So um, the work that I do really brings together diversity, equity and inclusion strategies and actions with an employee experience lens. So I typically look at um, you know, what is it that's getting in the way of workplaces genuinely working for different groups of people? Um, and what can we do to change that? And, um, you know, that in turn builds better customer advocacy, economic prosperity, and all of the rest of, of those things. Um, and whilst, you know, employee experience is vital, there are also um, other areas that benefit when we take a, um, a equitable design focus. So yeah, that's, that's me. That's what I do. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really glad to be here with you today, Sasha. So thank you for inviting me along for this conversation that I would say I am a um, an enthusiastic amateur in. <laughs> I think that's a great way of describing it. I'm probably the same. So welcome to everybody that has just joined. Just as a reminder, we are recording the session. So if you don't want to be on the video recording, just keep your video off. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Um, so uh, I guess leading on from Jen's introduction, for those of you I haven't met, um, as I said, I run an organization here called Workflow and we look at employee experience design. I'm typically in the digital space. So um, how do we design those digital experiences for all? Um, I'm personally very passionate about um, equitable design, which uh, Gem and I will come to talk about later as to why we connected on this topic and my personal experiences and challenges with this as well. So. Um, really great to be here. Lovely to meet you all. Um, and feel free to use the chat um, if you aren't comfortable taking yourselves off mute, but we will get to a point where you can take yourselves off mute and we'll just start chatting. So just a bit of background, and I've got a few notes here. So if I'm looking this side, that's what I'm looking at. I don't want to get this wrong. So what do we mean by equitable design? And I think it's really important to start with what are the descriptions of inclusion, equality, and equity, according to the dictionary. We'll start there. 
So inclusion is de defined as the action or state of including or being included within a group or a structure. Equality is the state of being equal, especially in status, rights or opportunities. And equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. So if we dig a little bit deeper into how are people talking about this in industry, um, Qualtrics recently published a post around equitable design, and they said the key difference is where um, equality gives everyone access to the same opportunities, equity in the workplace means that there is a proportional representation in those same opportunities. In other words, equity levels the playing field. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we have all seen that amazing YouTube clip of students all starting from the same spot. And, you know, the teacher says, take a step forward if you have ever been, you know, if you've had your tuition paid for, if you've ever not gone, if you've ever gone hungry or not gone hungry and so on. Um, so, you know, really not starting from the same point. This is about designing workplace experiences that benefit all employees, acknowledging the inherent bias of the organization and the structures that exist that create inequity. This entire topic is about identifying how we design with age, class, disability, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, and religion in mind. Um, Jennifer Wright, who is an architect, so actually a lot of the content around um, equitable design is, is uh, building architecture, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. And actually there are so many parallels says equality is giving everyone the, same, um, everyone the same thing. Equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful, which I think is really powerful. Just gonna let somebody else in here. Um, and she goes on to say, equity is much more nuanced, um, nuanced sorry, and it takes con consideration, it takes into consideration opportunities, needs, and at a broader level, the definition of success. It's assessing the innate strengths and weaknesses of a certain location, structure, environment, or individual, and leveraging those towards its best outcome. Again, context here being uh, architecture of buildings. Albert Einstein once said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So um, why is designing with equity in mind important? And just a few other supplementary statistics here. Um, they kind of cover more of the diversity and inclusion topic. And again, I think that's kind of, part of partly to do with the fact that equitable design is kind of a new concept, at least mm -hmm. in this region. So the supporting data is a little bit lackluster. So one in every six per, uh, people in the Asia Pacific region lives with a disability. Um, despite quotas across this region, unemployment rates for disabled employees is, is very high. Um, racially diverse teams provide 35% better performance compared to their competitors, um, and only 58% of companies in Southeast Asia have some form of diversity and inclusion program. And all of these statistics have been bought um, from the International Labour Office and a BCG report specific to this region. In a global survey by BCG, 57% um, of all respondents, 90% of those were who were from underrepresented groups, said that they would consider leaving their job for one at a more inclusive organisation. Mm -hmm. Employees from diverse groups in Southeast Asia are 2.5 times more likely to say that they have personally benefited from such programs. And diverse leadership teams report 19% more innovation and 9% higher earnings before interest and taxes margins. And a recent Open for Business study found that cities, and this is more coming back to that design piece, who are more inclusive of LGBTQ communities and residents had stronger innovation ecosystems, higher concentration of skills and talent and a better quality of life overall. So um, I'll pause there. That's a, just a little bit of a recap on why, we've, why we're here now. And I think with technology and the reliance of, on um, technology for digital employee experiences and employee experience overall, we really need to take a step back and see who are we designing for mm -hmm. and who do our systems and processes and structures serve? Um, and where does that come from? And, and structurally, how do, we, how do we continue to inspect and hold our design principles to account? So I'll stop there. Um, and before I hand over to Jem, just a recap on why this is such an important um, topic for both of us. So Jem and I connected a couple of months ago, um, again, in similar fields. And we had a really big discussion around um, equal design, equality, diversity and inclusion and our passion for all, all of the above. And um, I shared a story about my brother who unfortunately is um, disabled. He was born with a immune system deficiency that caused uh, various complications as he grew up, um, including some physical deformities. Um, so physically he looks very different and um, unfortunately his hands developed with deformities that 
he couldn't control. And um, he is slightly older than I am. Um, so he's in his mid thirties now. And he still lives at home with my parents, but he has um, an amazing job in a supermarket that he's had since he was a young boy. And um, he works there part time. Um, and it's just a, an amazing, fulfilling experience for him. But five or six years ago, um, where he moved into a different department of the store, he was put through a performance process that, you know, quite, quite frankly, was designed for um, someone without dis disabilities, a, a non-disabled person. Um, so it was a one size fits all performance process whereby my brother was assessed um, uh, and, and shown in the red for not uh, packing groceries fast enough. And part of this was due to the struggles he had with his hands. And uh, we kind of went through the very standard performance improvement process that generally goes along when people aren't performing well. Um, and again, dictated by head office, we're talking a really significant supermarket chain in the UK. And, um, you know, I had to really coach my brother and support him through those conversations with the HR team to basically say, you can't assess someone with such very obvious disabilities against um, someone else performing in a similar role where we're all held to the same performance standard. And it was a real eye-opening um, experience for me and for my brother and my parents to say, you know, actually, why is it that everyone is expected to go through the same performance process when actually we're not necessarily starting from the same point? Um, my brother still works at the supermarket, just to clarify that, and he's doing really well and he's thriving in an area where he can perform to his um, best capability and his, the skills that he brings. Um, but it was a really eye-opening experience for me. And I think that's where a lot of my passion comes from is, you know, actually people shouldn't go through the same process if it puts them at a disadvantage. And how do we challenge that within our HR communities? Mm. So I'll pause there. Jem, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that story, I think um, it, it brings up so many questions, doesn't it, around, um, I think, a couple of things in the typical HR world, which is how do we design roles um, and what does role design look like for with flexibility um, and what are, how do we um, set performance expectations and how do we do that in an equ equitable way? How do we recognise and reward performance and is that based on individual, um, you know, performance elements or do we have team-based contributions in there as well? And we're definitely seeing more of a trend towards organisations wanting to be more collaborative and having to look at, well, what does that mean in terms of how do we reward and recognise performance? Um, and so whilst that's a shift on a, you know, driven by the need for collaboration and to break down silos, that can also help people when it comes to that, you know, um, you know cultural co contribution in other ways. I'm sure that your brother has great relationships with customers that come in every single day. And I'm sure that he talks to them all, you know, there's, there's some connection that he brings, there's some richness that he brings beyond how fast he can pack the, the groceries right so looking at what that balance scorecard might look like and how you um, assess a team's performance rather than just an individual's performance these are all things that can help where if we stop to question um, what are the barriers and what is it what are the unintended inequities I think is a really we talk about in unintended um, consequences quite a lot in employee experience um, I think there's a real opportunity for people in the worlds that we're in in employee experience in HR to look at what are the unintended inequities that some of our systems and practices actually produce um, how do how do we look at that in both a design sense but also in an outcomes perspective so and I really liked your um, your summary up front around the definitions I think that's a vital starting point is do you know the difference between equality and equity because, you know, you, you got married recently, right? So, you you know, imagine that we're sat here celebrating Sasha's recent, um, you know, uh, wonderful nuptials. And um, we say, right, we've got a cake and we have uh, 10 people on the call. So everyone gets the same, you know, we cut the cake equally into 10 slices. That's that's equality. We give everyone a slice of the, birth, the wedding cake. Um, you know, equity, we think about what would an equitable approach be? It would be um, who's hungry right now? <laughs> Um, who needs who needs an energy boost? What kind of food do you need? Who has dietary requirements? And do we, you know, do we even need a cake? You know, that's sort of more of the the equitable design principles. You ask those questions rather than okay, we need to give everyone the same thing because that's fair and equal. Um, actually, it's better sometimes to just take that step back and say, what do people need? And that point that you made about the architecture um, example up front is, what do people need? What are their expectations? 
Um, and, you know, it's kind of that, that difference of equality is giving someone, everyone a shoe, but equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. So how do you try and figure out, well, what, what is that fit for everyone? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Maybe we can hand over to see if anyone in the audience would like to share their experiences or views um, on the topic overall of equity um, and equitable design. Don't be shy. <laughs> I think one of the challenges, just as people are um, coming up with a question, is um, you know how do what does fairness look like um, and if, if we are giving people um, if we're adjusting the start because we talk about quality being the start line and equity being the, the mm. finish line right so yes we want to try and get everyone to you know the same start line but if equity means that we're opening if equality is opening the doors equity is looking back to say is the path behind clear is the path ahead clear that can be tricky, right? Because you're going to come into some of these questions in HR around, well, is that going to be fair? If I treat Sasha differently to Angelique, how is that, how is that diversity and inclusion? Yeah. So maybe we can talk about some, I mean, I don't know if anyone has any questions or concerns or has had challenges in that space before. Um, Cause it would be good to tackle some of those things. Well, just, just actually coincidentally, just before this meeting, I was having a coaching conversation with um, um, someone, um, manufacturing environment, mm. um, and it was a, a gender issue in that um, a female um, was um, struck or more hesitating performing a task because she was fundamentally convinced she couldn't do it because of the physical mm -hmm. um, um, effort. Um, uh, required um, as as the operations manager was digging deeper to understand who's an it's a female operations manager who's keen to drive diversity in her area she just started this role and she she called me to have a chat about all of this but um, um, as she dug deeper she found that this person's been in the organization for two years as a casual has been signed off as competent when in actual fact um, we don't know if she's confident, competent or not, or even confident to complete the task. And you can't, I mean, I've seen, I can go on in this scenario. Mm. I guess what I'm saying is that um, the interesting part is one of the scenarios that um, the operations manager was actually considering is how can we do the job differently mm. so you feel confident doing it uh, in terms of using um, more, I'm happy to invest in the tools if I need to. So it makes um makes it easier for you to do your job. Yes. And again, I, I think that's a, a case, a clear example of equity in that you're still coming to, you're still performing the same task. You're just doing it differently, but the result's the same. Yeah, I like that example, um, Angelique, thank you. And I think that with um, uh, one thing that Sasha and I have talked about is um, a book that we've both read, which is called Invisible Women by um, Caroline um, Criado Perez, which I think I've mentioned to you before, Angelique, as well. Um, and there are examples in there of where um, they, we talk about like the inherent requirements of a role. That's kind of a phrase that is used across regions. You know, what is the in inherent requirements of the role? And that is the standard that we're going to be holding you against. We need you to perform these tasks and these activities and this is what success looks like um, I think there's actually inherent bias sometimes in the way that we design those requirements so just just to do exactly what you've um, said and take a step back and say um, what is actually essential in terms of the inherent requirements of the role what are the negotiables and the non-negotiables and how could the role be performed differently and what would success look like in that sense um, and what does that look at, like at an individual level and across the team and what are again some of those unintended consequences if we were to change that does that mean that we can look at changing it for others as well and and what does that look like um, and there were some great examples in the book around even things like um, the design of airbags and them being designed around a you know a certain weight of a male body and a certain stature mm -hmm. um, whereas if we actually look at who are the different individuals that we might have coming into our teams or using the airbags? Um, what are their needs and their requirements and who are they? And then how do we relook at, well, what is the airbag? Or in our situation, what are the inherent requirements of the role? And if you take that simple kind of airbag world um, in, in a car and you think about it in terms of role design and performance setting, 
then you can start to ask those different questions. Um, who is potentially going to be using this? Um, who, who is potentially going to be hired into this role? Not who do we have right now, but also who might we have in the future? Mm, yeah, definitely. I love that book. And I know that we've spoken about it before as well. I've got a list of a, a few a few examples here. The, the seatbelt one is definitely one. And I think what we're getting to with this example is that that's a prime example of where we have designed for one person or one person in mind or one standard in mind. Um, the other ones that kind of get me because I work in a co-working space and I'm always cold. And so I have to have two jackets on the back of my chair. And actually there's some uh, data within the book, Invisible Women, that says most officers are too cold for women because the formula to determine temperature was developed in the 1960s on the metabolic resting rate of a 40 year old 70 kg man. Um, and women are 50% more likely to be misdiagnosed following a heart attack, just another um, stat there. And speech recognition software is 70% more likely to understand men. Now, this is not me going on to um, a feminist debate here. We'll save that for another conversation. But this is just more to articulate that actually, you know, when we design with one person in mind, the outputs are pretty shocking. I, I'm sure you agree, Jen. Yeah. And one of your questions, I think, before to me was around, um, how do we balance this idea of personalization with, you know, we can't have multiple versions in organizations of, mm. of things like that is a tension that we have to navigate. You know, equitable design is really about the principles and asking those questions. Yeah. Um, what it isn't is having a very different process for each of the 1000 employees that you might have in your organization. Yeah. That's going to be too hard to maintain. That's not really necessary. Um, so I think that, you know, a couple of practical ways that I think about that, if you think about onboarding and even the technology of Emboarder, using, using them as an example, um, what they do is that they, um, when you're being onboarded into a new organization, rather than assume you need that you're going through exactly the same experience, they apply choice and logic and ask questions. So if you're going through the workflow, then they're, they're going to try and provide choice um, at that stage. So, you know, what, what, what is the most important factor for you in setting you up for success? Clear goals, excellent technology, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And then they can provide you with or what are your fears, number one fear or concern in your first period, you know, first three months. Um, and you can actually then start to address that by asking, you know, two or three questions and just provide um, some choice and some personalization through that process. And I think that works with something like workplace adjustments as well. So um, what adjustments do you need to set you up successfully um, from day one in our organization and get them, get the employee to tell you what that looks like. I think sometimes in HR, we feel like we need all the answers. But sometimes we're better off just having really good questions yeah. um, and having the right process to ask the questions at the right point um, and simply asking someone with a, you know, with a disability, what does, what, ad what adjustments do you need? Um, and what would you like us to provide? And some people will bring their own equipment and it's just not making any assumptions. It's just ask the questions. Yeah, definitely. And you raise a really good point around the whole personalization and, how far does it go? And there are a couple of things in my mind. So, you know, typically when we look at technology implementations in the HR space <clears throat> and beyond, we always say don't uh, don't design for the minority. You know, we go with out of the box functionality as much as we can. So actually a lot of the language of process design or systems design is very much about designing for the majority. Mm -hmm. And so that's one aspect. The other is um, uh, volumes. So, you know, quite often when I talk with um, HR leaders or we look at, you know, the return to work process is a particular passion project for us as an organisation. Yeah. A lot of what, what we hear is but there aren't the volumes and it's only a small percentage of, of the workforce mm -hmm. that is impacted by this. And it's almost a double edged sword, right, because you're like, I, I get that in terms of volume for investment. But in the same breath, it is such a small percentage. Why can't we get it right for them? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I kind of throw it back that way. I think one of the things in researching this topic as well, and you're exactly right, um, Gem, it's about how do we take a step back when we're designing the process to say, how does this work for people not designing seven different versions of a process to meet mm -hmm. everyone's requirements? It kind of brings me back to the concept of that design thinking piece. And actually, yeah. there's a there's a really amazing research paper that I'll make sure we, um, we share with everyone um, published in um, Harvard Business Review around equity and design. And it's a company in the US called Equity Design. Mm. And then 
um, I'll, I'll read it out. So they, they looked at the flaws with design thinking. So design thinking is amazing, of course, but they said, while elevating the user in the design process has been the key to design thinking um, success, it is also the reason why our current approach to design, to design thinking needs to be retrofitted. If we believe design thinking is the right tool to use to redesign products, systems and institutions to be more equitable, then we must redesign the design thinking process, mindsets and tools themselves to ensure they mitigate for the causes of inequity. And they've gone on to kind of, they, they share a little bit of, um, you know, how would you go about ensuring that you're designing with equity in mind? And they've, they've raised some topics here around designing at the margins, starting with mm. yourself, seed power, make the invisible visible and speak the future, design the future. And I think a lot of that as well, kind of an, a, a very simple thing for everybody on the call is, if you're looking at how do we redesign our performance process, who do you have in the room? Like, who do you have that you're asking? Um, does this work? Will this work? Who are you prototyping with and testing with? And again, I think that kind of gets into the design at the margins and making making the invisible visible, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think, and I, it comes back to that phrase that we we hear quite a lot here um, in Australia. And we we adopt um, particularly around um, First Nations and um, inclusion and, and reconciliation, which is nothing about us without us, right? So, if there is some likelihood, which um, some likelihood that a person with a disability is going to go through a performance um, goal setting and a performance management process, which like spoiler alert, that is happening if one in six people have a disability in the region, then um, you need to understand how that person is going to experience your process. And you need to think about what is the experience we're trying to create for our people? You know, how do we want them to think, feel? What do we want them to be doing? All those typical design questions. But rather than use the general employee or just to use the people in the room that maybe have similar experiences, it is just to step back and say, you know, who's missing here? Who's not in the room that should be? Um, and how might they experience this process? Um, and how what, what might be the experience that is created? Um, you shared something really interesting with me previously, Sasha, as well. You can tell Sasha loves research. She's always pinging me the odd article. Um, and I think it was around um, the experience of engaging on flexible work right now or, or remote work, work from home, let's just say. Um, and, and I know in some of the regions that people are from today, people are still working from home and working remotely. Um, and there was something in there that said that, um, you know, one of the unintended inequities around working from home is we, th we thought it's great for people with disabilities, but even that statement, and I, I found myself reading an ABC article thinking, oh, look, it, it has leveled the playing field for some people with some disabilities, but also for some people with disabilities who have been engaging in um, work from home, they haven't had the support that they would normally have. They also might not have access when other people return to work if they stay from home, are they going to miss out on promotional opportunities and project work because there's a distance bias to where they're up, where they are. Um, so I think that this is the key to not making assumptions around these, we call them sort of underrepresented groups, but they're a large cohort of, you know, our society, especially when we look at intersecting identities. So women, women with disabilities, um, you know, the, the parenting status, um, there are so many intersecting identities. And I think that's the key as well. It's not one person with a disability. It's, you know, a carer with someone who's caring for children who also has a disability. You know, there's, we've, we have many layers. So let's just pause and think who's in the room, how will they experience um, the workplace? Yeah. Um, and then work, work backwards from there. Yeah, definitely. Actually, it's so funny you mentioned that. A couple of weeks ago, because um, I've been doing, again, um, interviews for, for a research study on the return to work experience. And actually, one of the ladies I spoke to um, was deaf. And she was explaining to me that actually working remotely um, and being able to um, work on Zoom is a great thing for many. But when people, um, and this isn't saying, uh, this isn't sending a message to anyone that isn't on video, it's totally fine. She was saying it's really hard because as um, remote work continues to become the norm, people turn their cameras off because it's exhausting, right? When we're on mm. cameras all day, and it makes it really hard for her to be able to follow the conversation because she's lip reading. And so I hadn't even thought about that. And I think this is more going towards that 
goodness, if we don't have that representation in the room or we don't take, to your point, Gemma, take a step back and say who isn't here and who aren't we designing for, um, you really miss it. You know, it's not something that I had ever considered. And I would happily walk into um, a webinar or a workshop and have my camera off, not thinking twice that there might be yeah. someone that's hard of hearing on the call. Um, yeah. You know, completely, complete blind spot for me. Yeah. And Angelique's just said it's the same issue with masks. So, um, you know, the mandatory mask um, use, particularly in Victoria right now, um, it's, it's the same thing that we're experiencing. And while some people just were like, oh, we're getting used to this, it can be a real um, barrier. It can actually introduce a new barrier for some people. And so I think it's been really, um, you know, looking at even within the digital space, Sash, that you do a lot of work in, um, what are some accessible design principles? Talk about equitable design, inclusive design, accessible design. But ultimately, it's let's put um, people at the centre of, of what we do and we look at all types of people. And we don't just look at the person, but we look at the whole system. I think that's what equitable design is for me. It's looking at the range of people and then also looking at the system that has overlapping systems systems of oppression um, yeah. and how do we challenge ourselves knowing the system that we're working in and knowing the type of people that we're trying to support to thrive in our workplaces and so you know things like um, use the use of closed captions which is something we should actually look at for this video recording or future video recordings things that we're learning on on the go but um, capitalizing your hashtag so that when someone searches for a social media post they can actually find the post if we don't use capitalization in hashtags, they can't find it. So these, these are the things that I'm just learning about myself um, and should be much better at. And, um, you know, there, there are things that if you look at accessible design, then it's going to be good design for everyone. If you can build a ramp for someone in a wheelchair, you're also building a ramp for someone who has a pram. And so, you know, it's, it's never normally you're just designing for that one need. There normally is benefits for other people with other needs as a, as a result. Yeah. So one of the business benefits, I would say, is accessible design is good design and good design is accessible design. Um, and it, you just have that breadth of applicability. Um, I know we, we've done some work on color contrast before in organizations. And, um, you know, it's not just the people who have a vision impairment, but it's also other customers that say, oh, I can actually see that better now. I know it looked yeah. cool before, but I wasn't sure exactly what you were saying because it was a, the tone was off in your colors. Yeah, yeah, totally. We have that all the time with like employee portal design. Yeah. And sometimes when people design it, they'll be like, we've got this amazing picture of Santa Claus with the white text over the top. I'm like, I can't even see that, let alone anyone with a slight visual impairment. Like, okay, guys, let's scale it back. Think about this because you're right. It's not just, it's better for me, but it's also better for everybody else as well. Yeah. So um, just looking at some of the questions that we wanted to run through, um, maybe Gem, I'll throw this one to you. Um, how do you drive personalization without designing multiple versions of a process? Mm -hmm. And then maybe that leads on to what tips would you give for the HR teams on this call if they're about to embark on an EX project and they want to ensure that you design as part of that? Yeah. Look, I think one of the principles that um, I briefly touched on before is this idea of just try and get diverse lived experience in the room when you're designing, when you're going through the, you know, an empathy stage, whatever your process is. But normally there's some discovery work, right? So, you know, what does this need to, what does this process need to achieve? Um, who is it designed to serve? How do we want people to experience it, right? I think if we do that with very limited people involved, kind of our typical go-to people, um, we're going to probably design with assumptions in mind. And they're going to be able-bodied assumptions. They're going to be heteronormative assumptions. They're going to be gendered assumptions, right? So the more people we can have um, with diverse lived experiences, and as I said, we have intersecting experiences. So it doesn't mean that you need one person that represents every type of social or professional identity, because I'm sure that you'll be able to find someone that can give you three worldviews, right? They, and, and so I think it's just, it, it's really just pausing there and opening it up and saying, look, we just need diverse perspectives as we go through the discovery phase, because you're going to discover things that will benefit the, the design of, of the process or the, um, the policy or the experience that you're trying to create. So I think that's the first thing, you know, nothing about us without us. If you've got employees involved, in your workforce that are LGBTIQ with disabilities, different genders, et cetera, you're gonna kind of need them to understand what their needs and expectations are of that process. Um, so I think that that for me is one of the, the main things that you can do. I think driving personalization, 
I'd say a huge amount of it sits with leadership capability as well, because like we can design great systems, we can design great policies and procedures and experience in an architecture sense. But we both know, Sash, that the leaders and the managers are the ones that have to execute it and they have to deliver it properly. So I really would want to take a look at what is the capacity and capability of our leaders to have really personalized conversations and to know the difference between equity and equality and to know what's within their power to sort of question and say, I've just been given this process by HR or I'm new to your company. I'm just about to do this with an employee, but he's just told me that, um, you know, he's got a regular caring commitment. He's a single father. Um, and I just don't know how that, I feel like that's going to be difficult for him. It doesn't feel fair to just force this on him. Go back, question that, you know, what does that look like? So I think manager capability, capacity, and then having just some basics around equity versus equality and knowing how to personalize the experience for the person sat in front of them, not mm -hmm. because HR have told me I've got to follow this process. Yeah. Um, and, and for them to have the curiosity to ask and say, OK, I do have Sasha's brother in front of me and this is what I'm going through, rather than go into autopilot and just run with that process, go back and say, hey, Angelique, I, I just this has come up for me. What, what should we do to make sure that he is supported, um, valued and is thriving, thriving? It doesn't yeah. feel like this fits him. Um, it's just those those the ability to pause some of that psychological safety as well, as we know. Right. Just the ability to say hey, um, you know, to speak up without fear of repercussion, to say, well, you just do your job, mate. That's not going to work, is it? We need we need someone yeah. to speak up and, and be curious. And I think that another key thing is that we do need, um, we need allies and accomplices and we need people who, you know, like us, we're learning. We, we need to fast track our, um, our disability advocacy. I think, you know, we've both talked about that. Um, and, you know, if we can do that, then we not that we can speak on behalf of the community, but we can certainly pause and say, this may be an issue. Can we connect with someone who has a vision impairment to understand how they might experience this? Like, I'm not sure that like there's something triggering me to say, I don't know if this will work for them. I don't have all the answers. There are some design principles we can use, but who do we need to engage that hasn't been engaged? So I think that's our role as well. If we, if we are true allies in the workforce. Yeah, definitely. I think it's such a good point around the manager um, actually thinking, OK, who is in front of me? And I think, you know, if I ponder what would I have changed about the process that my brother went through, it was exactly what you've described. It was it was designing a process that covers off the basic fundamentals. And I actually think that this is applicable to all employee experiences and HR processes we have to run, which is like, what are the basic fundamentals that we have to comply with legally and yes. to get this get this from A to B? Um, but on above that is kind of that case for personalization and mm -hmm. empowerment. So if your managers feel empowered to make decisions around those processes that you have got the basic fundamentals to pass on, um, that's amazing for employees. Because, you know, if we go back to that example, the manager is saying, OK, Michael, what can we do to support you? And yeah. actually, what is it that you need? And let's have a conversation about it. And yes, we will still go through this process, but we understand that everybody experiencing this process is different. Yeah, I read the same way to um, and what I'm seeing emerge in, in the research around the return to work process is there are the fundamental elements that every working mum will want during that process. But above that, everyone is so different. It's for managers and organisations to say, here's how we can support you. You tell us what's going to work for you, where you are. Yeah. Uh, it's yes. really powerful. Yeah, yeah, really powerful. And um, I've done some... Oh, sorry, Sasha, I was going to say on the return to work, I've done some work with um, with Circle In, who were a provider, as you know, who do um, parental leave and parent engagement. And they have a fantastic solution around that. And one thing that we looked at was what does a supported experience look like and what does an unsupported one look like for working parents? Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the key things are inclusion matters. So, um, you know, you talked about working mothers because 95% of people who take primary carers leave are mums or are identify as female. Um, but the language to working parents can also break down the stigma mm. for, yeah. for, for dads to take leave. So we found, you know, inclusion matters, language matters. Um, but we also found that it was enabling and empowering the leaders to ask the right questions at the right time. So we nudged them at the right time to ask the right question so that they don't go in and say, oh, Sasha, you're off on leave next week. OK, we're going to take you enjoy this time off. We're going to take all of your devices off of you and you're not going to have any access to equipment for that period because you go and enjoy time with Bub. 
like that's sort of a default but that might be really anxiety triggering for you as someone who likes to stay in touch mm, yeah. um the same as the opposite we're not going to take your devices off you you'll probably want to stay in touch every single week to know what's going on okay anxiety inducing for someone else so really the question then becomes while you're away what kind of communication do you want from us and what what um, access do you want to retain in terms of access to systems and tools you tell me and it's just that difference around the question to the assumption yeah yeah definitely um, I'm, I'm keen to kind of open up the floor and see what everybody else thinks as well but I think just to kind of recap on how do we think or what would we recommend to HR teams looking at equitable design the only other things that I would add to to what Jen said and actually a lot of it's kind of similar is making sure that that question this concept is part of the um, ideation process the strategy definition your design process regardless of what process you're transforming or implementing it's definitely one you know maybe coming up with an equitable design principle and socializing that with the team is is really key so you know as you start your project saying this is what we're always going to come back to I think it's it's always a nice reminder um, and listen and gather the data so use the data that you have um, ask the questions maybe set up focus groups or invite people to contribute and be part of that design process um, is really key um, and yeah everything else that Jen's already covered as well I just think you know they're and they're not expensive they're not complex things to do they're fairly simple but just ensure that you're you're thinking of everyone really or or those in your organization so we've got some comments here in the chat as well um, people agreeing with you Jen yet yeah, leadership is huge um, empathy and compassion it's funny um, those two comments came through exactly at exactly the same time around empathy and compassion and it's spot on and I think you know empathy training and leadership will help is what Laura Laura has said I think people forget empathy is it's an, there are observable behaviors associated with that so there are observable behaviors you it can be trained can be developed um I, I sometimes see people say oh they've either got it or they haven't oh they'll never be a leader that's going to have that kind of empathy stuff they're just a really good technical leader and it is what it is, but um, don't under underestimate the ability to build the capability of empathy and to talk about what are the observable behaviours that we see alongside it. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree with, with you both on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Miranda's got a question here. Um, how do we get leadership buy-in when there is no perceived equity issues from their perspective? So a male-dominated mm. finance environment. Oh, it's tricky. I think, you know, my go to is always um, if you can get any um, any data do. Um, it's kind of two layers to that. One is the, um, the the stuff that you talked about at the beginning, Sasha. So what are the research papers out there? How do we help understand how people are experiencing inequity in the workplace at large, not necessarily our workplace, but if we can get that external data and we can paint that picture, that can, can, can sometimes help. Um, I think, you know, depending on who your executive team are, you can either look at what are the risks and you can take the compliance and legal and risk angle, um, which is, you know, th there are huge, particularly here in Australia, you know, you can have a um, Human Rights Commission complaint if you, you know, you don't offer accessible, um, you know, if you're not offering your website, that's, if it's not accessible to all customers, then someone can lodge a complaint with the Australian Human Rights Commission. And if you want to spend your time in, in the courts and, and dealing with complaints, then by all means, ignore it. If you don't, then let's pay attention to it. I guess that's kind of more of the problem mindset than the opportunity mindset. But depending on who your executives are and what they care about, you've got different levers to pull. So that is one. Another is what is the opportunity if we design for, you know, there's great research out there around good design and accessible design. You know, when we design for people, like I said before, wheelchair users what we are also found that it was also great for people with low mobility um, older people people with prams people with bicycles and all of a sudden our restaurant became more accessible to different demographics not just the wheelchair users that we designed for in, in the, the first place so I think there's some real opportunity um, case studies that you can paint the picture of as well um, so yeah, I think it, it really does depend on, um, on whether you've got the opportunity mindset or the sort of deficit mindset. Um, and if you have internal data, it's very powerful. Um, with an organization I've worked with before, they found that their engagement score was 20 um, percentage points different 
um, for carers who were supporting people with um, disabilities or caring for um, elderly parents compared to those with school aged children. And so you talk about parents and carers as one cohort, but if you look at those that have preschool children, school aged children, and those who are caring for people who are elderly or with, with disabilities, you can then start to think, well, they need a lot of support right now because they are 20 points lower from an engagement perspective than the other cohort. So where we need our focus is really on them. So internal, being able to look at your demographic data and your experience data and cutting and dicing it is useful, but I know that not everyone has those instruments in place. So external can be useful in the absence of internal data. Yeah, love that. Um, and actually, um, Miranda, what we'll send out in terms of the, the prior research, everything we've referenced, I've also got another HR technologist um, article, which is really good, which talks about what is the value add of equitable design. Um, I'll make sure you get a copy of that as well, because it might help to form the foundations of that business case. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Thank you. Thanks, no Miranda. Um, Navanita just made a really good point here, which is um, don't underestimate the power of having your senior leaders engage with people um, with lived experiences. Um, and having senior leaders moderate conversations between um, individuals. I've seen that work really well as well, Navanita. And um, uh, I've also seen um, here in Australia, um, senior leaders go through a, um, uh, an immersion experience where they work with people with disabilities to walk alongside them, wheel alongside them um, and experience the workplace um, in a one hour period from entering the building to having a cup of tea to going to a desk and saying this is how I experience it from my perspective. Even something as simple as moving your co coffee cups from the top shelf to the bottom shelf can be one simple action that you can do in your workplace. And it doesn't emerge until the people with decision making power sometimes walk next to I'm not saying that, I mean, we all have the decision-making power to move the mug. So like we're all in that, but in other aspects such as the size of the doors, how the mechanics of the lifts operate within your buildings, sometimes doing that walkthrough alongside them and listening to their experiences um, can, can definitely make that shift. It has to be done in a really nuanced way though, that, that you know, just a really respectful way. Um, mm. and, and the person who you're centering needs to be really considered. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, just coming back to, because I think what you've uh, described, Gemma, that's so powerful and actually a really important exercise. I would love to hear more about that mm. actually and, and see how, see what leaders take away from that as well and how that relates to, as uh, Navanita said, compassionate conversations and, and actually identifying um, where changes need to be made. But I mentioned earlier this um, uh, XTX design research and this organization in the US that are really focusing on equitable design. And a lot of it is rooted in, um, uh, in, in um, racial injustice in the US, yeah. um, but they have basically extended the traditional design thinking framework. So if we're all familiar with it, kind of traditionally define, ideate, prototype, test, reflect, right? Kind of traditional design yeah. thinking, if we're redesigning performance, we go through those steps in a room full of people. And they've added, similar to what you were saying, Jim, notice and empathize as two steps before that defined stage. And this is how they've defined it. And again, we'll make sure everybody gets a copy of this. They say, the notice phase focuses on you, the designer, in order to build a practice of awareness of your values, identity, biases, and assumptions, and your impact on the user and context within which you are empathizing. This allows for authentic user-centered design, not you-centered design. And then it moves to empathy where it says the empathy phase of the process is focused on understanding the experiences, emotions and motivations of others. Designers use specific empathy method methods to learn more about the needs of the users for whom they are designing. And I think that kind of really nicely wraps up everything we've touched on, which is before you get into that design phase, think about what are you seeing? What do you notice? What don't you see? And what don't you notice? And who are you empathizing with? Mm. Um, what do you yeah. think? Love that shift in the model. I think it's it's vital. And you know what? Um, I think one of the key takeaways is as well, you know, we talk about, oh, recognize your own bias, but it is that introspection that's required, you know, that self-reflection um, and just saying, where are my gaps? And I'm, I know that my gaps are, um, you know, I, I feel awkward today talking even about, you know, people with disabilities. I, I have a disability. I, I have mental health challenges, but, you know, very different. And so 
um, some of that I sort of, sort of have to rein myself back in and think I can't speak on behalf of that community. So what's, you know, um, there are some gaps that I have, but also I don't want to be silent and complicit. So I have to strike that middle ground. So, you know, doing that reflection to think about where are my gaps um, and how do I bridge those gaps is a really part, big part of self-awareness. Um, and that reflect phase that they've built into that model really takes into consideration, you know, what shaped my worldview and where are my gaps um, and where am I likely to conclude something as the experience rather than just an experience? Yeah, awesome. Does anyone on the call just, you know, I'm conscious we're, we're nearing the end of our discussion, but would anyone like to take themselves off mute and throw your camera on and just maybe share your thoughts on the topic? No worries if not, that's absolutely fine. I think we've really had a lot of pip. Yeah, hi. I, I, oh, this is on the video this morning. <laughs> um, but certainly uh, one of the biggest issues I've seen is the design of technology. I know you mentioned about the, um, the uh, HBR article that you were referring to. But, you know, designing a lot of these for people who have uh, trouble seeing or trouble feeling or trouble it, it, hearing, it's very difficult. Um, and often we not just have to get over the barrier of leadership not interested um, or believing we don't have a barrier or an issue, but we have to get technologists to do the same. And it's even more difficult. You know, your CEO is not interested in, in inclusion and inclusive design. It's even more difficult um, with, uh, with most of the, the IT gang. And if you ask vendors, they'd look at you like you're mad. Like, mm. you know, why would we be spending so much time designing something for 2% or 5% of the population? Yeah. Uh, so that makes it very difficult. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very true, Pip. Very true. Um, and it is, I think, what, what the way it's considered... Um, I completely agree. It, it, it is a struggle. The way that I've seen um, organisations who do have it built more into their practice um, is when... Um, there's a, a, either there's been an issue that has forced them to care, unfortunately, and there's been a complaint or an issue where they've had to build it in, but trying to get them to build it into their practice as opposed to it being an extra thing is a real, real challenge. Um, so I, I don't have the answers for that, but I think that's where we're heading is the problem we're trying to solve is how do we mm. get people to care about this when we're talking about this, the few percents here and there? Yeah. Um, and there's only I think there's only so much in a fast pace. One of the I think one of the barriers to it is, a, is the action bias that we have in fa fast paced organizations. We're very action oriented and there's a bias towards action. And that means we don't slow down to ask these questions and we don't we will not afford ourselves five percent more time or repurpose five percent of our time to discover what it means for someone um, to experience this in a way that fits them. So I think the action bias is a real barrier to us being inclusive and equitable in our design. And there's something in that that mm. um, I'm not sure how we break, but we have to work on it. Yeah. Interesting agree, point. Sorry, please, Angelique. Uh, it's interesting point there, Gemma, about what you've just raised about the action orientation and being fast paced. And I guess the question that comes to mind that tr triggers the question, we've just been through nine, 10 months, whatever it was of a, living in a different world right mm -hmm. and now you're hearing this end of year rush everybody getting ready for 2021 to ride the wave the fifth wave the new wave right um it will be interesting i guess to that point um have we learned mm. something to cause, have we truly learned the cause for pause here in terms of um being inclusive about people working from home or working differently and having different requirements or are we going to leave everything to 2020 mm -hmm. and just look forward to 2021 and just do what we've always done it's a question i have on my mind i don't know I'm i agree in different views. yeah what do people think I, I think it's a good question are we ramping is everyone ramping into this sprint mode or are we going to take some of the lessons and learnings for for you know what do we want to keep from 2021 it's certainly stuff we want to leave behind but what do we want to keep if i take hi pip here um just to take on your point earlier Gemma, uh, i agree with the the action bias i also think that there's a, a tendency only to use technology for efficiency 
and it's wrapped up in that. Um, it does not uh, lend itself neither to slowing down nor to ask um, questions around value and what is valuable for individuals. Mm. Uh, because regardless of how fancy the tech looks like these days, it's really just, you know, Taylorism 2.0 um, in many ways. Uh, in, in terms of what we're leaving behind, the rate, rise of uh, monitoring software that I am seeing, um, which I believe if we look at the, the inclusiveness of monitoring, you know, people looking at screens, people sitting at screens, automatically we're going to see women disadvantaged because who's getting up for the kids more often from the computer? Who's struggling to, you know, to, to keep everything balanced? Um, so I think a lot of the techno technological choices that have been forced through the pandemic and that may continue um, into 2021 simply because it's difficult to rip them out. Now, once you've got these technologies in, ripping them out is a lot more challenge. It is also very difficult. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't think we're going to leave behind or what we do have, rethink it, where we've got the time to rethink it and work out, was that the right decision, um, you know, today? What do we need to alter? Um, I, I think that we will, many organisations will use the pandemic as an excuse to leave that change in play and move forward into something else and hope that we all ignore and forget about the fact that we're being monitored and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah really interesting that, point. Valuable points, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. And, and Navanita, I think you had a point that you wanted to raise. Sorry to put you on the spot. I don't know if you still want to share. No, um, I don't know whether I'm being cynic, uh, being a cynic or not, but you know, having been in the space for kind of 23 years now, the cynic in me just comes out. And I do feel that, um, that a lot of these issues, you know, suddenly mo most organizations, if not all, are talking about workplace flexibility, for instance. However, they're only seeing it within the pandemic uh, uh, thing. And that's my fear that, uh, you know, everybody has jumped onto this bandwagon called the COVID normal. What on God's sweet earth does that even mean? Uh, you know, uh, um, and my cynicism comes from the fact that all of these things are fantastic. Yes. However, if we still not talk about very specific accountabilities. And I'm yeah. not talking about just accountabilities of executive team and board, but accountabilities across, you know, unions and what, uh, uh, you know, across the length and breadth of the organization. Uh, and I don't think we are talking enough of that. I mean, we just saw the annual report from WGEA. I mean, howsoever binary that report is every year, they don't go, they don't see beyond the male, female, we do know the state of affairs in the country, right? And it all hinges down to uh, accountability or the lack thereof. So we can keep on talking about these various issues um, in silo, but it hinges on accountability to me. And uh, I, I think it is it is an imperative now to not have polite conversations. It is yeah. imperative to have uh, you know, conversations where you are naming and you are pointing out that yes, a commitment has been made by you and you are not doing it, why? Uh, and I'm not sure we're doing that uh, often enough. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think you're, I think you're a realist, not a cynic. I think that's, um, I think that's spot on. We don't, it is all a bit too polite. It's all a little bit binary and siloed in the way that we talk about particularly, um, you and I know this never need to, but you know, we talk about these single issues and, and these single lenses that we put on stuff. And, and it is like, how do we look at stuff through the kaleidoscope and how do we look at all the systems um, and how do they interact? Um, and, and the collective issue is true so how do we how do we talk about the collective issue and drive the individual action do you know what I mean like if someone in a digital or an IT team wanted to become a self-appointed advocate for accessibility in design work how are they going to be rewarded for that how are they going to be recognized mm -hmm. are they going against the grain are they getting pushed back um, or are we celebrating their curiosity are we mm -hmm. celebrating their tenacity and their ability to weave in all these concepts into what they do so um yeah it's actually a really big conversation that we've unpacked here Sasha and we've like yeah. scratched the surface so I know we're gonna have to keep <laughs> it going another time I think yeah no definitely so yeah we are just a little bit over time but 
And as we touched on at the beginning, like Gemini is still learning. And I think we all are, right? We're trying to figure out what does actual design mean in the concept of employee experience um, anything outside of building architecture. Again, coming to that original data. This is a conversation I really want to continue. And I think, Gem, you feel the same. I think whilst we do not represent and cannot speak on behalf of um, the disabled working population and so on and so forth. I think shedding light on this topic and getting people to think more about design is really important. So let's talk about follow up and hopefully everybody can join us as well. We can continue this conversation. Um, as I said, we'll send the recording out and we'll send all of the research referenced as well. So you guys have links to that if you're building your business cases for export design. I'm sure it'll be really helpful. And yeah, thanks so much, Jen. Anything from you as we close? No, I'll, um, I'll send you through a few resources to put on the email list as well, Sash. Yep. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, let's just continue the conversation. Thank you everyone for attending and for learning with us and sharing your thoughts and, and feelings on the matter. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Mm -hmm.